my, my clicker just turned over to eight o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. I think we have a fair amount of material to cover today. Welcome to Cornea Theme Grand Rounds update. Uh, I'm Mark Mifflin. Uh, we're going to be, uh, I'm going to present a uh, talk and then either Dr. Zog or Dr. Ip will present next. We're not quite sure yet. Um, and I'll be talking about limbal stem cell transplantation. Uh, Dr. Zogs can give us some updates in the area of our field, I think, including talking about the new uh, pilocarpine eye drop for presbyopia. Um, Colin is going to talk about uh, some DMEC complications. So I'll get started. Um, maybe. No, no financial disclosures. Um, Limbal stem cell deficiency, I'm not gonna really go into that whole, um, um, is, or I'm not gonna go into the, all of the pathophysiology or kind of how to approach limbal stem cell deficiency, except to say that um, it, it runs a spectrum. Most of us know what that is and it involves <clears throat> scarring and loss of normal cells on the ocular surface, which obviously interrupts the clarity of the eye and the ability to see and refract light. It can be, it can range from complete as in the lower left panel to other uh, variations of partial, which are thrown in the, shown in the other three panels. Um, and as I mentioned, basically there are two components. The most important is that we lose our corneal phenotype um, squamous epithelial cells that are highly developed to be clear and very uniform and form really um, good uh, optical layers that refract the light regularly and support the tear film. Um, but they also perform a barrier function which um, prevents the natural tendencies of the conjunctiva blood vessels and scar tissue to grow onto the cornea. Um, the diagnosis is really a clinical one, although impression cytology, um, looking at, you know, even biopsy, looking at uh, markers, cell markers and staining and confocal microscopy can all, also be used to, to help decide or, or prove uh, different variants of lumbal stem cell deficiency. Um, I'm not going to really talk about non-surgical management much, but it is important in these patients to um, manage um, the uh, acute causes, which are generally injuries of a variety of sources, or in the latter part of the slide, prevent other conditions or comorbidities, which allow limbal stem cell dysfunction to worsen and um, eventually cause loss of corneal clarity. Um, just quickly mention, um, Kind of temporary or partial limb stel limbal stem cell dysfunction is very common in contact lens wearers and also due to medication toxicity. So always think about that. I've had countless, countless patients in my career where I've just simply withdrawn medications, put them on maybe some preservative-free steroid for a while, withdrawn contacts, and their stem cell dysfunction gets better. There's a lot of nomenclature associated with this topic. We don't need to go over all of this, but I'll describe the uh, different things as we go through them. Um, it does become kind of word salad and the abbreviations are actually helpful in sorting it out. It's actually pretty simple. Um, if you just sort it down to the tissue being transplanted and whether it's an allograft or allogeneic uh, process or an autologous graft. Um, the different variations of surgery can be performed um, either autologously in the case of the three that are listed there, or if it's an allogeneic graft, um, a more um, in block type of uh, sclero um, corneal graft is performed in the, in the form of keratolimbal allograft. Um, people have also used uh, living related donors in the case of the non KLAL grafts and, and HLA matching is sometimes done. And I have some experience with that I'll mention later. Um, the in block procedures, as I mentioned above, are keratolimbal allograft and then the CLAU stands for conjunctival limbal autograft, which we'll be talking about in a couple of cases today. Um, 
The other type, other approach to this, which is a little more modern and more simple, is um, proliferating uh, donor limbal stem cells. And when I say donor, could be from the fellow eye or from a, a donor eye, but um, and proliferating them on amniotic membrane, and that can be done in 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 situ in vivo, and that's SLAT, simple limbal epithelial transplantation or it can be done in a culture type setting and CLET stands for cultivated limbal epithelial transplant. So um, keratolimbal limbal allograft is performed for complete uh, limbal stem cell deficiency. The most common use for this is aniridia. It actually has the best prognosis. I learned about this from Ed Holland and others, but there are really large populations of aniridia patients, including many that I've treated here in Utah, who've done pretty well with this surgery over a long term. Um, we also use it quite a bit for chemical injuries or burns. Um, and as many times those are uh, bilateral injuries. Uh, it's not used as much for unilateral um, conditions because some of the other techniques can be uh, better. So this is just a little diagram I borrowed from Dr. Moshefar in a recent um, online publication that he did. And this uh, diagram just kind of shows the idea of keratolimbal allograft, where the uh, in panel A, it just kind of represents removing the scar tissue from the eye, um, taking actually two donor eyes that are um, relatively fresh and have good epithelium. And the eye bank actually prepares these with a skirt of conjunctiva left. And then three hemi uh, sections of the uh, donor tissue are used to um, make a complete 360 degree barrier as shown in panel B. Um, and that provides not only the limbal stem cells, but also this really strong barrier to reconjunctivalization and vascularization. And this is actually a patient that uh, I'll show a, a picture of later. This is a gentleman with aniridia. This surgery was from about 2000. That's why the video or the picture so bad. Um, but um, back then it was long enough ago that we were getting whole donor eyes and whole globes. And so this is just shows harvesting the keratolimbal graft. Um, and now we use, uh, you know, cornea in situ corneal scleral rim. So we'll show an example of that as well. But the tissue is partially um, dissected with some cornea and a very thin uh, rim of sclera with overlying conjunctiva and, of course, the important limbal stem cells. And then it's actually recessed and sutured um, a little bit posterior to cover the limbus. And that's why you need three half uh, circumferences to uh, surround the eye because we're recessing it or moving it back. Um, this is actually just a picture of the fellow eye of that same gentleman in Iridia patient after his uh, second eye um, limbal stem cell, keratolimbal limbal allograft. So the challenge really with this surgery is it's technically not the easiest surgery. It takes a little bit of time to do that manual uh, dissection, but mostly immunosuppression. And this requires strong immu immunosuppression, similar to what a patient would get for a kidney transplant. So it's not really the best option for all patients, um, especially if they're younger, childbearing age, et cetera, but it does actually work well. And there's a high success rate in a lot of, I won't go into this uh, diagram. It'll be in the box uh, presentation if anybody wants it. Um, um, it. It actually works well for patients who are willing to go undergo systemic immunosuppression. And sometimes that means even young patients um, if they have bilateral disease. This is actually that same eye. I didn't have a recent clinical photo, but this is a recent topography of this gentleman uh, 19 years out from his keratolimbal allograft. And he's still seeing about 2100 to 2150 out of this eye. He's actually a gentleman who has pretty good phobias for um, uh, aniridia. And his fellow eye also has had the surgery and he's maintained um, good clear corneal epithelium for um, Almost, well, his other eye is actually further out, more than 20 years out. And he, he was back in the days when we used uh, cyclosporin, azathioprine, and uh, prednisone for immunosuppression. He was on that for about three years. Uh, he's been maintained on 
uh, restasis twice a day, and I think he's on chloromethylene twice a day and has not rejected his grafts after all these years. Um, partial limbal stem cell deficiency might be more sectoral. If you can see in the top panel, there may be some areas, especially on that left side laterally, where there might be some actually functioning stem cells. There are other areas where they look like they're pretty wiped out. You know, maybe three quarters of the limbus looks pretty abnormal in this patient. But um, sometimes when there's, uh, you know, some population of healthy cells, it's better to do some kind of a partial, uh, less aggressive surgery. The bottom panel just shows the chronic epi defect in a patient with a, a cornea transplants times five or six and just poor, poor surface, just, you can, just couldn't grow her, uh, her epithelium. So for this surgery, um, we would consider doing, uh, if they had a, a healthy fellow eye, a conjunctival limbal allograft, or, um, or even a, this can be done from donor eyes as well, but um, generally doesn't work as well as um, um, keratolimbal allograft. I'm even stumbling over the letters. Um, the uh, conjunctival limbal autograft, which is um, taken from the fellow eye, actually works really well. And it does provide a partial uh, barrier effect. So this, this is a really good surgery if you have you know, some quadrants of vascularization that you want to kind of block. And uh, maybe the patient has some functioning stem cells. And, and particularly burns, this seems to be a good surgery. Many times the inferior uh, limbus is burned and there's some sparing superiorly. Um, this is just shows some how we harvest the, uh, the tissue from the, the uh, fellow eye can be done under topical anesthesia, or sometimes we do these patients under general. Um, it makes it easier just to work on both eyes at the same setting. <clears throat> just a picture suturing that um, limbal transplant into position. And notice that we take a fair amount of conjunctiva with this because it is the patient's own conjunctiva. And if we recess the scarring, we can actually um, have that uh, donor conjunctiva from the other eye kind of contribute to um, maybe uh, making the fornix a little bigger or just uh, decreasing scarring from sutures too close to our other graft, the limbal part of the graft. Um, this just shows healed tissue after um, the donation and, and, you know, a couple of weeks of healing and things are well, um, uh, fellow eye limbal stem cell deficiency has been iatrogenically induced by this surgery. So one has to be careful not to harvest more than at the most six o'clock hours and pay attention to other pathology. But in my experience, I've never seen um, any problem with this, even harvesting up to six donor clock hours in the fellow eye. Um, this is, I'm going to zoom through these because I don't want to take too much time, but this is actually a patient who, one of those patients who had had multiple, multiple transplants, was monocular, had a living related donor from a, an adult child, a uh, limbal stem cell transplant, it's actually shown on the left there. That's actually where the conjunctival limbal transplant is from the donor and really help the patient. This is actually another example. Well, this just kind of shows that, you know, how clear this cornea is not perfect, but for sure, um, corneal phenotype uh, epithelium. Uh, many of these patients with multiple, multiple repeat surgeries uh, have failure of stem cells. And then actually another patient, this was his seventh transplant in his monocular eye. And he also had a uh, living related donor transplant from his son, who was a six out of six HLA match. And he did well with this graft for a few years until, um, I can't remember, I think he got a central retinal artery occlusion or something and eventually went blind in his only remaining eye. But we were able to keep his eye seen for years because of the stem cell transplant. And that just again shows the ocular surface of that same eye. Um, SLET is one of the kind of less invasive to the donor tissue procedures where we take a very small biopsy, a little bit smaller than what I just previously described, cut it up into pieces, put it on amniotic membrane, which is uh, placed on the eye after removing the scar tissue. And then basically these little donor uh, clumps proliferate in situ with the protection of a bandage contact lens. That's called SLET. And again, amniotic membrane, we've been using amniotic membrane 
for these kind of surgeries since about the late 90s. And um, interestingly, BioTissue, which is the company that we started with, is still going strong. And most of us still use this frozen amniotic membrane. It seems to be a little better than the dry stuff. Um, this is a video. I'm not going to show the whole thing, but it, it does show. Let me go back here. Shows the uh, slept procedure, just a slightly different way of. Um, let's see, sorry, it will play. I just need to let it play. A uh, little bit different way of harvesting. Um, there, there's more than one way to harvest the, uh, the donor tissue. In this, in this video, we're approaching it from the conjunctival side. Um, on the other uh, video that I'll show in a minute, we're approaching it from the corneal side. This patient had a, um, a, a thermal injury actually, and um, you know had had multiple rounds of amniotic membrane, Procara, et cetera. Um, seems like all these patients come from Idaho. This guy was from Idaho. And, um, we weren't really able to completely clear the vascular panis from his eye. It was um, pretty deep. And, um, but we were able to recess the conjunctiva and try to smooth the tissue a little bit here with the diamond burr. And, um, and I'll jump ahead here. So we put the amniotic membrane on there. Um, in this case, suturing it into position also with fibrin glue underneath. And, um, that's the fibrin glue, the amniotic membrane's in place. Um, and we take our donor uh, tissue, and I, this is a really good donor tissue here. You can see there's just a little tiny bit of sclera on it. So I'm 100% sure I've got those limbal palisades in this. It's, it's very thin. We divide it up into 10 to 12 sections, um, and then we place it on the surface. And, um, and I'm going to show another video of this, so I'll just, I'll just quit this one. Um, this surgery can be done with just a bandage contact lens or uh, amniotic membrane over the, the slight donor tissues. In this case, we used two layers of amniotic membrane. This just shows the fellow's eye about a month or two after the surgery. You can kind of still see peripherally the little islands of donor tissue that have stayed in place. Um, he actually, even though his cornea looks pretty hazy, he improved about five lines from, you know, 2400-ish to about 2060, 2070, 2080 uh, with refraction and about 2080 to 2100 without refraction. He actually, we were thinking originally we were going to do a cornea transplant on the side, but um, he just decided it was good enough that he didn't want to mess with it anymore. That just shows the surface. It's not a great picture, but you can kind of see in the lower right, there's probably some conjunctivalization and then the more shiny, uh, good looking cells centrally where the corneal phenotype epithelium is present. Um, so uh, the slut surgery, again, kind of showed you the, um, the way that we do that it is an in vivo or in situ expansion. And then this cultivated limbal epithelial transplantation is doing basically the same thing, taking a donor eye, um, cultivating the cells either in a, sl a slurry or more, more commonly on amniotic membrane and the growing them in uh, kind of a culture for maybe three weeks or so and then transplanting that sheet of the amniotic membrane and cells onto the eye. It's not widely practiced in this country, as you can imagine, there's a lot of, um, there'd be a lot of uh, maybe expense and issues, but certainly something that is, um, um, promising for the future, I think, with bioengineered limbal stem cells, uh, you know, maybe kind of making truly compatible cells. This may be something that we'll be doing more of in the future. Um, this video, Colin and I did this case in November, and Colin put this together. We're going to post it on Core, and it it actually, when I was kind of looking through the literature, it may be. I'm not sure this has been described. Um, it's the first time I've done it, and I just thought it would be a good idea. We have a, a for also from Idaho, 45-year-old gentleman who um, was working construction and got a cement burn to one eye. His other eye was pretty much completely uninvolved. 
So we decided to, we wanted to do a sled. He's young enough, he didn't want to have um, systemic immunosuppression. But when you see his eye, you'll, you'll know why I wanted to, uh, I felt a little nervous about just a sled because he has such aggressive vascularization and conjunctivalization that I just felt like there was no chance that this would really work for him. So we combined it with the keratolimbal allograft. So there's our little, little donor graph from the fellow eye, and we're gonna, we're gonna reserve that and just put in some saline on a little telfa sponge, and then we're gonna move over to the other eye. Um, this gentleman had two rounds of surgery with uh, Doug Marks before I saw him, and um, Doug was able to put some mucous membrane grafts in there on the top of the, near the lid speculum, you can see a little bunched up area where one of the mucous membrane grafts is. But um, one of the really important things with these cases is um, making sure that you manage the eyelids and you know other aspects of the anterior orbit as well as you can before you start putting these delicate cells on there. And so we really appreciate our oculoplastics colleagues who, who debulk things and get things ready. And another thing is it's really important to let these things kind of burn out. And this guy is now, this is about maybe 18 months or so out from his original injury uh, or longer actually. But even, even waiting for the mucous membrane graft surgery is I think we waited you know, three to six months at least. In this case, we we're really lucky to be able to find this corneal plane. You're always a little nervous dissecting because you're not sure how thinned out the corneal was before it scarred over. But for this gentleman, we were just cautiously proceeding and we were able to find a pretty good plane there. I'll jump ahead here in the interest of time. So, and then we, uh, just like the other video, put some amniotic membrane on there. Um, and then we'll use our donor tissue. Oh, uh, yeah, I forgot. This is the keratolimbal allograft. So let me go back here a little bit. I'm gonna um, show with the, um, let's speed it up here. Um, this, the, just getting our donor eye from, so from an eye bank eye, which is uh, healthy, younger, fresher tissue, you can see that the conjunctiva is left on this eye purposely by the eye bankers. We have to, we have to request this. We can make about a half thickness um, scleral corneal um, rim. And this one, we didn't really divide it in half. We just got more like a three quarter and a quarter from, we only used one eye because we didn't really want to completely have the limbus with uh, foreign tissue cells. But so this is the keratolimbal allograft just being sutured on over the amniotic membrane, which has been pre-placed. And uh, interestingly, I'm not sure you can see it in the post-op photos, but the only place where the vascularization is really coming in is in those areas um, it, where we don't have that barrier keratolimbal allograft. Um, so now we have our, our little donor slat tissue. This part looks like really similar to what I showed before. So I'm just gonna zoom through that. And then um, we did not use a second layer of amniotic membrane. We put a bandage contact after our fibrin sealant and it's sped up and bedded a little bit, but we, we kind of let this dry for a bit and then you place your bandage contact lens. And so that, and that's that gentleman. Um, he since moved to Nevada. We've only seen him a couple times postoperatively, but um, just a few weeks ago, we saw him for a six weeks postop. You can see how good the eye looks. I mean, it's completely epithelialized. That little spot there is just an area where the, the basal amniotic membrane has kind of melted, but he's completely epithelialized. Um, pretty good, good view through. Um, that's just another view. The amniotic membrane does stay kind of hazy for a while but with time that will clear up. <clears throat> and then that's the donor eye, which heals very nicely. So I'm not gonna go much further here because I know these other guys have good, good stuff to talk about, but um, I, when I, you know, whenever I do something like this and I start to dig into what's known about it and then more so what's not known, it reminds me like hiking up in the Uintas and this is a picture of our feet, myself and four of my adult children on the top of King's Peak. And, you know, when you get up into the Uintas, you realize how big, big the country is. And you could just, you could never hike every peak up in the Uintas, even if you did it every day, every summer for your whole life. And sometimes I feel that way when you're trying to understand all the immunology and just 
all the little nuances of um, this kind of stuff. But I can tell you that it's been super helpful to me in my practice. And this limbal stem cell surgery is actually does work. It requires um, TLC and, you know, very good compliance from your patients. And you have to follow the immunosuppressed patients really carefully because you can't actually kill them with the medicine. But um, it certainly works well. And I really look forward to future advancements of um, this case, I think, is something that might be um, interesting in that if one could provide a keratolimbal allograft as a barrier and then uh, have better ways of transplanting these more simple um, epithelial proliferation, it may, it may work better for um, diseases like um, OCP or Stevens-Johnson's, and maybe we'll get to where we can really cultivate, cultivate some uh, conjunctiva and corneal cells, and then just put like a KLAL on there as a barrier to keep all the scar tissue from growing back onto the cornea. So um, anyway, thanks for your attention. And we'll, uh, it looks like Colin's on. So uh, Dr. Zog said, Colin, he wanted you to go next. So okay. take home points, sorry, wasn't my last slide, but basically I just said what was on there. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Oh, Colin's already on, so thank you. Thanks, Dr. Mifflin. I'm sorry for cutting you off there. Um, so I'm Colin, one of the Cornea Fellows, and I'll be briefly going over um, DMEC complications. I have several videos um, of ours and photos, as well as a case at the end. Uh, my talk's divided into three categories. First up is intraoperative complications, followed by early postoperative complications, and finally late postoperative complications of DMEC surgery. So to begin with intraoperative complications, complications, I would like to first brief, briefly review uh, DMEC surgery. Um, here's a diagram of a scrolled DMEC graph, um, and below is a DMEC graph in the Jones tube. So the, in this day and age, um, DMECs are pre-prepared in the eye bank and given to us in a modified Jones tube to be injected into the eye, as you can see down here. Um, here, this diagram, the um, the endothelium is actually on the outside of the scroll, and the desmids layer is on the inside. Um, this is pertinent to the next few slides. Um, when this is injected into the eye, we manipulate the eye so that the, the scroll unfolds um, like a taco, and, um, and then we approximate it to the posterior cornea. Uh, so the first potential complication of intraoperative DMEC surgery um, is ejection of the graft through the corneal wound. Um, here in the photo below, you can see the DMEC graft here being stuck and eject, being partially ejected through the main corneal wound, even with the Jones tube in the wound. These grafts are very flimsy, they're flexible, um, and they will follow the pressure gradient. They can go through the main corneal wound, they can get stuck in the paracetesis wound, and you can see here the graft being stuck in the wound. And this is not ideal, you know, the endothelium is, is getting damaged in this process. Um, another potential co intraoperative complication of DMEC surgery is loss of staining of the graft. As you can see here, um, without staining, it's hard to see the graft even under the microscope. Um, and another uh, extension of this is um, these crafts have either an F or S stamp to let the surgeon know the correct orientation of the graph in the eye. And the stamp itself can also lose staining uh, potentially. And if, that, if that's the case, can make it very hard to know what the orientation of the graft is. Um, next, uh, I have a video of one of um, a previous fellow surgery um, where the surgery is complicated by um, a hyphema or hemorrhage in the eye, um, unfortunately caused by the suturing of the main corneal wound. You can see there's um, some blood being leaked into the anterior chamber. Um, a hemorrhage in the eye has several potential, makes surgery a little bit more difficult because it's harder to see sometimes that there's a lot of blood. It also can, the blood can get in the interface between the graft and the cornea. Um, so the graph may not be fully attached or increase the risk of postoperative detachment. Um, in addition, blood in the eye um, increases risk of rejection or inflammation too. Here they're trying to um, get the blood out, but it's 
not possible. So they decided to um, just to go ahead and open the graft and get it attached to the cornea. <clears throat> you can see that there is some blood in the interface here. Um, and you can also see the S stamp here. So we got the graft attached and, and the gas bubble in. And uh, fortunately, this patient did well. The, the hemorrhage resolved on its own and um, um, didn't have any detachments. And this next video of an intraoperative complication with DMX surgery is um, one of uh, my surgeries uh, this year, um, or is, yeah, this past year. And this is an uh, illustration of, um, or injection of the DMEC graft into the posterior chamber. So like I said earlier, these grafts will follow the pressure gradient. Um, here you can see I'm, I'm putting a little bit too much pressure on the eye. The eye needs to be more centered. Um, and then this is the DMEC graft in the Jones tube getting prepared to be injected into the eye. And you have to be very careful with this process, um, applying only very light pressure. And you can see right there, the graft just gets in injected right into the posterior chamber. It was a slow motion video. and so at this point, we're expecting to see where this graft is, and it's it's actually behind the uh, intraocular lens, but between the bag and the lens. So somehow it got shot there, um, and we spent a lot of time manipulating the eye to try to get this graft out. Um, during this whole process, you know, the more manipulation of the graft, you can lead to more endothelial damage, um, which is not good. Um, and you, you know, you don't want to touch the graft with your cannula. It's um, DMEX surgery is a no touch technique. Um, so luckily we're eventually able to release this graft from this spot here um, with careful manipulation. And you see the graft is coming out. And eventually we're able to um, get this graft into the anterior chamber, open it up, um, get a bubble in and get it attached. <clears throat> Fortunately for this patient and for us, uh, the graft actually did very well. It um, stayed attached um, with no rebubbling needed and, uh, and it's working and the, and the cornea is clear and the patient has pretty good vision. <clears throat> so yeah, those are several potential intraoperative complications with DMEX surgery. I'll be um, moving on to early postoperative complications. And I just have a few photos here. So this is shortly after surgery. So, you know, number one potential complication is graft detachment. Um, so the number one cause of graft detachment after DMEX surgery is um, that the graft was not fully attached during the primary surgery. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell, but these grafts want to scroll inwards. And so you have to look carefully at the edges to make sure that the edges are completely flat to the cornea underneath the air bubble. Um, if there is a if there's a little scroll at the edge of the graft, the scroll may continue to scroll in, as you can see in this photo, and lead to a detachment. You can see the scroll here on the edge. So this is a graft attachment here. On the uh, second most common cause of graft attachment is poor support from the, um, from the air or gas bubble in the eye. So we inject gas in, or air into the eye to keep the graft attached, and we have the uh, patient positioned face up. Um, if, the, if there's poor positioning by the patient, or if, you know, for example, the gas leaks out through a leaky wound and there's not enough gas in the eye, this will increase the risk of a detachment after surgery. Um, here on the right-hand side, you can see there's a cleft in the middle of the graft. So there's an area here with fluid between the graft and the cornea. And so this is considered a detachment. And both of these will need to be um, rebubbled in the minor procedure room um, postoperatively. Um, in this case, this eye will probably need a little bit more manipulation uh, with, uh, with cannulas on the corneal surface to open up that graft again. Another potential uh, complication shortly after surgery is pupillary block. Um, so like I just mentioned, we put gas in the eye um, to keep the graft attached, but if, and we put a lot of gas in the eye. Um, to prevent pupillary block, we do an inferior per surgical iridotomy. Um, and we do it inferiorly because gas floats. So we want the aerodynamy to be patent, um, not plugged by air. But if there's too much air, as you can see in this diagram here, the air can block the, uh, the aerodynamy and the pupil and lead to pupillary block. Um, to relieve this, you let air out, you burp air out. So you can see post burping air, there's um, no pupillary block here. 
Um, in this diagram, you can see that here too. You can see that the, LP, the PI is open. But of course, you don't want to burp too much air out because the air, the air gas is there to support the graft and you don't want to graft attachment. So you have to be careful. <clears throat> and finally, a potential, and this is, you know, with all intraocular surgeries, potential for infection. Um, this is a picture of a graft that never cleared. And on slit lamp exam, there's a plaque on the posterior capsule behind the lens. This patient got uh, P acnes and optimitis after DMEX surgery. <clears throat> and finally, moving on to late post-operative complications. Um, so, <clears throat> so there's more time after the initial surgery. So number one is primary graft failure. So primary graft failure, it means that the graft never cleared and never really worked after surgery. You can see here, this is a picture of a swollen cornea, decimates folds, and a DMEC graft. And here's a slip beam of that. And so this corner is swollen and never cleared after surgery. So number one cause of primary graft failure, or primary graft failure is caused because the endothelial cells are not working or not working well enough. And this can be caused by damage to the endothelium during surgery, if it was a complicated surgery or there was a lot of manipulation. Um, so that's one cause of primary graft failure. Another cause is uh, the, the donor graft may not be healthy. Um, so maybe it was a poor donor, low endo count, or whatever reason. So these are two causes of primary graft failure, and this, this eye will need to be regrafted. Um, another late uh, postoperative complication is allograft rejection. So these are pictures of KP on a DMEC graph. Um, so as you know, eye is an immune privilege system. And fortunately, for corneal transplants, these patients don't need systemic immunosuppression. They just need topical immunosuppression with steroids. Um, and uh, the most common cause of allograft rejection is the not enough steroids. Um, and this could be from poor compliance, um, poor follow-up. And luckily, the treatment for this is just increasing the steroids. Um, unfortunately, if there's recurrent rejections or there's a really bad rejection, this increases the risk of graft failure. And finally, um, a, no, my last, actually, no, not my last one, but this another late post operative complication is infectious keratitis. These patients in particular are at higher risk for this because they're on steroids, topical steroids for a very long time. So suppressed immune uh, ocular surface. And in addition, these patients usually have some form of corneal pathology like uh, bullous keratopathy. So they may have an epi defect, so loss of barrier as well as sometimes we do a superficial keratectomy during surgery. So these things increase the risk of infectious keratitis and that's why they need you know, good follow-up <clears throat> to prevent this from happening. And finally, I have a case of a, a, another late post-operative complication. Um, this is one of our patients. Um, this is a 65-year-old who underwent DMEC for Fuchs and Adela dystrophy. Um, this was done by a fellow, and the case was again complicated. Uh, the, it was there was intraoperative complication. The graft was actually injected under the iris, um, and it was stuck in the iris. Uh, fortunately, it was able to be you know manipulated and repositioned uh, into the, into the anterior chamber and bubbled under the cornea. Um, shortly postoperatively, there was a cleft that uh, was rebubbled in clinic, and the graft uh, remained attached. Um, but the cornea never cleared. So this is an example of an intraoperative complication and then an early postoperative complication for, or, um, uh, with the rebubbling and then the graft never cleared. So primary graft failure. Um, and, you know, for a year, it seemed like it wasn't sure, we weren't sure if the graft was going to clear or not, but the, um, gave the graft a lot of time, lost steroids, and it actually never fully cleared. So um, the decision was made to after the discussion with the patient to do a DSEC um, on the same eye. And this was done about a year later. Um, and the DSEC went fine. Um, the cornea cleared. Unfortunately, the best corrective visual acuity of this patient was 2400. And, you know, we expect the vision best corrected after DSEC to be a lot better, like 2030 or closer to that. So further workup was done. And an OCT MAC was done. And unfortunately, it showed a significant cystic macular edema. Um, and this was not previously known. And so this was treated with topical uh, steroids and NSAIDs. It didn't need any injections. And after resolution, the best corrective visual could improved to 2070. 
but you know this is you know unfortunate because there's been some permanent damage from the edema um and you know this this case just um you know illustrates why we you know F, we well, let me back check so we we did not know we assumed that the poor vision was from the swollen cornea throughout this whole time and um and the and retina was not fully evaluated. So it just illustrates the importance of doing, you know, thinking about the whole eye, doing a full workup, making sure that, you know, it's not just the cornea that's causing the poor vision. Um, so, and, you know, CME is a, is a late postoperative complication. Um, yeah. And that's, and then my presentation, does anyone have any questions? Well, thanks, Colin. I, I, I see uh, macular edema not terribly uncommon um, after EK, after endothelial keratoplasty. So definitely when a, when a cornea is cleared and a refraction is not giving us uh, the expected outcome that we want or hope for, then I think, you know, evaluating the full eye is a good idea. And sometimes you can end up with macular edema. Sometimes you can actually get optic neuropathies from elevated pressure after that uh, air fill. So there's a few different sort of causes for loss of vision after endothelial keratoplasty, but um, this is definitely one that's treatable. So we did watch for that early. I, can I just chime in really quick? I would just add that, um, and I just, just sent a chat, but um, not just postoperatively, but preoperatively, we really need to think about all the causes of visual loss. Just yesterday, Kyle and I saw a patient referred for endothelial transplantation, and that patient is uh, had uh, poor vision and both eyes, but one was significantly worse. And long story short, we found a submacular hemorrhage, and the patient is a high myope and probably has some myopic degeneration with some choroidal neovascularization. So, so just remember to be thorough preoperatively as well. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna go through a couple of uh, cornea and refractive updates with you. Um, I don't have any financial interest to disclose. Um, we're gonna go through a couple of different things. One is the new Vuity drop that was recently um, approved by the FDA for presbyopia treatment. And then we're going to discuss the, the Technus Ihance intraocular lens that uh, was released on the market earlier, I guess, late last year. Um, first of all, the Vuity drop, it is essentially a pilocarpine um, drop in a different uh, percent than we're used to using. Um, it's a 1.25%. It is essentially FDA approved for one drop daily in both eyes to enhance near vision in presbyopic patients. Um, typically lasts about six hours. It's a cholinergic muscarinic agonist. So it's gonna act on the ciliary muscle to kind of give you a little bit of a myopic shift and then it'll, it'll shrink the pupil a little bit to give a pinhole effect as well. So those are the two mechanism of actions that were used to, to try to give this enhanced near vision. Um, there were a couple of studies that were done, about 750 subjects that were studied over about 30 days. Um, these are patients between 40 and 55. Um, about 30% of patients had three lines of near vision gained um, without losing more than one line of distance vision. So, so the, the trade-off to kind of causing that myopic shift in the pinhole effect might be a loss of distance vision in, in some patients. So about 30% seemed to fall in that ideal category where they had a pretty significant increase in near vision um, with their distance vision still, um, still held, it, uh, held good. Um, there are some side effects to this medication. It does have the BAK preservative in it with it only being given once a day. Um, it's uh, fairly uncommon to get too much effect from the preservative, um, but they have warning labels on the medication about night driving. So I advise these patients to use it only in the morning um, for daytime use only um, so that you don't have too much of that myotic pupil to cause problems at night. And then there is a retinal detachment risk as, as is well known with higher percentages of pilocarpine used in the past for 
um, glaucoma treatment that hasn't been hashed out with this lower um, percentage yet. Um, a lot of patients describe a little bit of a headache with this and then also um, redness of their eye that, that is uh, transient. It's not covered by insurance. It's about $80 um, as a cash pay. When you prescribe this, the pharmacy will try to do a prior auth on it. And so I essentially write in my prescription, do not prior auth cash only so that you don't have delays in, in the prescription of it. Um, we do have some samples of this floating around. Um, the reps have been, have been giving samples to try. I have a couple of technicians that have used it um, with good success. They noted a little bit of the headache, felt like their distance vision was good um, and had that enhanced reading. Um, so I've only been using it for about a, a month on my patients and have prescribed it to a few and haven't heard back yet um, on their results. So, so the jury's still out a little bit, but we're getting um, some early results back. Questions about Vuity from anybody? Okay. All right, so the, the Technus lens, um, Technus came out with a new lens called the iHance. Um, it's labeled as the DI Boo. Dr. Olson, let's see. I had a question. I don't know where my controls went to unmute you. All right, there I am. Uh, so it, it's interesting, you know, I watched a beauty and, and what's happened. I mean, pilocarpine 1% has been around forever. Uh, <clears throat> I go back in the days when that's one of our major ways of uh, treating glaucoma. And uh, uh, it was well known, you know, back in those days that 1% uh, pilocarpine, I mean, people would try it and say, you know, it, it allows me to read and, and go fairly well. But by and large, most people who tried it for a while found the headache and the hyperemia, you know, not worth what they were getting. So I'm, I'm just curious, you know, with time, what's magical about this, that it's going to be much different than, than what's been around forever. And frankly, uh, you know, a bottle of pilocarpine 1%, because it's been around forever, um, and generic is available, was incredibly cheap. So it's going to be interesting to see they're charging way more for something that really is just a formulation of pilocarpine. I know they've got things they're saying to, but as I read it, it's, it's pretty minimal. So this is, this is an example of something that, that um, has been put in a study and, and now is being charged probably 80 times what it should be, uh, uh, you know, even though this is something that had been around for a long period of time. And generally, over time, most people found the side effects not very good. So it, let's follow this chapter and see, but do know that this is a deja vu all over again. Yeah, a lot of those same concerns were brought up in the chat. And I, I do think, you know, the jury's out. We just kind of have to wait and see what happens with it. Um, okay, so the this new iHance Intractor Lens, it's uh, in a preloaded delivery system. It's the DI Boo um, that we have on consignment here at the Moran. Um, it's also available in the Toric um, lens model. Um, it's essentially FDA approved as a monofocal lens. Um, it has this higher order polynomial aspheric surface is what they sort of describe it as, as a biconvex design. Um, what you get out of that is you get a slight gradual central steepening of the lens. So you're almost going to get a little uh, a depth of field with that. Um, they did frost the haptics um, to help minimize rotation after implantation to help with the, the toric rotation problems that have been seen in the past. Um, the ZCU model also has frosted haptics, which is kind of the regular um, previous Technus Toric lens. Um, it comes in a plus five to plus 34 and half diopter steps, similar to the other um, lens consignments that we have. Um, what we see with this lens is that it has a broadened defocus curve. Um, it gets kind of a bigger bump at about minus one. Um, some patients can see a trickle effect clear out to minus two. Um, what that would give you is essentially a little bit of an enhanced intermediate vision. Um, it also maybe gives you a little broader landing zone as well. Um, so these patients tend to see better distance, even if their um, refractive error is a little higher than the previous uh, monofocal ZCP lens. Um, so that's kind of nice for some patients. A lot of patients, if you target like minus a half, they seem to have a pretty good depth and still have good distance um, vision in, in their eye. Um, I'm still targeting Plano in these and not overselling it. I'm essentially telling patients that you might have some benefit to your up-close vision, but, but this is 
still just a distance lens is how I, I sell it to patients essentially, or give it to them since it's not, uh, not uh, extra cost to the patient. Um, as far as clinical outcomes, we're starting to see some studies come out. Um, so there's one that came out in GCR, JCRS that compared um, the iHance lens um, to the actual Symphony lens, which is made by the same company. It's an um, EDOF lens. Um, what they found is it actually gave pretty similar distance intermediate vision and um, had less dysphotopsias in the iHance patients compared to the Symphony lens. So there's maybe some benefit there to having a, a lens that you're not having to charge the patient for, but they're still getting some depth to it. Um, another study that came out that just compared the standard ZCBU versus the DIBU. The ICBU sort of nomenclature is if you don't have it in the preloaded system, but it's that same lens. Um, they had some similar distance uh, visual acuity outcomes and their intermediate vision was a little bit better in the, in the eye enhance uh, model. Similar dysphotopsias between the two groups. And again, better sort of ability at intermediate tasks in the ICB group. Here's the defocus curve that kind of shows that sort of second elevation at about minus one with the eye hands lens um, compared to the standard ZCB lens, which, which flattens out a little bit beyond minus 0.5. Um, the interesting thing about this lens in the preloaded form, um, I haven't used any preloaded lenses before. I never, never used the PCBU, which was the regular ZCBU lens in the preloaded form. Um, and so there's, there's some different sort of ideas of how to do this um, correctly. Um, it was essentially the instruction that we received was you inject a little bit of BSS into the injector, um, and then you push the plunger down, as you see in this bottom left photo, and it'll engage the little um, cross hairs on there that you can then start to turn the lens and that will just fold the lens um, by itself. So the two different ways that this is done is, is one is just if you plunge it and then just do one turn to engage the um, rotating mechanism or if you plunge it and then rotate it all the way in um, to essentially load the lens all the way down the injector. So you have either a partial load, which is just a one turn, or you have a full load where the technician essentially loads the lens to the end of the injector, similar to how all of our lenses are placed um, in the eye. And I'll kind of talk about some of the nuances of, of some issues that we see with that. Um, so if the tech does a single turn, I'd term that as a partial load. Um, what that leads to, because there's only BSS injected into the the tip of the injector, is, it's only filled with BSS rather than OVD. Um, you get a reflux of intraocular fluid or OVD coming from inside the eye into the injector. And you'll then get a drop in pressure intraocularly um, while you're injecting that lens. The haptics tend to stick less when that happens. So you see haptics stick on the um, optic or haptics stick together. And that happens less if you have the single turn, which means that the lens isn't folded for very long. If you have the multi-turn of the full load where the lens is essentially put all the way down to the end of the injector, it definitely creates a more stable injection. So you don't have as much reflux of fluid and drop in pressure. You still can, um, but you'll definitely see more um, sticky haptics um, as these are, are unfolding in the eye. So let's look at the chat here real quick. Let's see. Yeah, Mark brings up that maybe targeting minus a half, which I, I have found I've occasionally done that in kind of the non-dominant eye, and I think it gives a little bit better up close vision and still doesn't seem to compromise the distance. I have less 2015 patients with the with the AI hence lens compared to the ZC Boo. Um, the Symphony study, I know I, I kind of agree with you. I'd like to see more data on that, maybe more patients, because it was a pretty small study. Okay, so I'm gonna show you um, some videos. I did some recordings of my surgeries yesterday um, to kind of give you an idea of the different um, loads that happen and sort of their effect. So this first one is where the technician just did a one turn load. And you'll see right at the beginning of um, when I engage this lens, you'll see a big reflux of fluid from the eye. 
see that air bubble and everything that kind of came back. So the eye softens, so it's way less pressure inside the eye. So your bag is gonna be have more wrinkles and potential for, uh, for tears. So you have to be really cautious about inserting this. I always insert kind of right toward the iris um, as I'm going into the eye, keep my hand pretty low on the injector. And then I um, sort of drop that uh, lens right at the last second. You can see the haptics just unfold freely here. So they're not stuck down to the optic, okay? So let's show another one, kind of a, the same thing here. So another short load. This one happened kind of early. So you'll see like some, a little bit of heme come into the injector as I hit play. And so again, the eye is really soft. Um, so you have to be really cautious with injecting the lens without that OBD fill in the injector. Again, on this one, the haptics um, are not stuck to the optics, so they kind of it unfolds pretty quickly. This one, um, my keratome, I found out was dull on the tip, and so I had a really bad wound. It wasn't. I like to tickle my wound to enlarge it just slightly. I hate doing wound assist, but I had to do that on this one, and you'll kind of see the result of that. You can see the, the, the heme come up into this lens, even though it was a full, full load, the lens was actually put all the way down into the injector. And there was also some OVD that came out the side um, port incision. I kind of show that again, you can see that OVD coming out there. So again, a softer injection, um, so you have to be a lot more cautious about it. You'll also, I don't know if I kept, yeah, but I kept this one running because the haptics um, stick. So you can see both the haptics are stuck on the optic. They're not coming off very easily. So it takes a lot more manipulation in a soft eye to get these haptics off. I hate how I got that one a little bit off, too far off to the side as I was being a little forceful there. What I find with this is you have to get the pressure back toward essentially where that haptic inserts into the optic um, to try to get it to come off easier. I've got a couple other videos that show that a little bit better. So here's another um, full load, no reflux of any, any OVD. Um, so the injection is a lot more stable. But what you'll see is the, the haptics definitely stick. It's usually not the distal haptic that sticks, it's usually the proximal one, but the lens is a lot slower to unfold. I'll kind of show in this one what I do when this proximal haptic doesn't come off very quickly. What I essentially do is I rotate that haptic so that it's distal. Um, and then you'll see kind of if you put the force of your, of your instrument essentially back towards where that haptic is inserting, it comes off easy. So that's a really common um, thing that I see with it. So these are all just cases from yesterday that I did to kind of show all the differences. So no reflex there. Nice stable injection. And then again, this is, this is the feared haptic hand holding um, that can be really tricky to get undone. I usually will try to pull up on the lens and use the anterior capsule to see if it'll give me enough pressure. If it doesn't right away, I give up. And this takes two instruments to get it unhooked. What I essentially do is I'll hold down with my irrigation aspiration handpiece, and then I'll lift up with the second instrument, and that usually unhooks it pretty quick. Um, let's see. I think this one, this one actually had a full load, but still had a little bit of reflux. So I'll kind of show this. And I think the reason this happens is if you lose, it's, it's really subtle there, but if you lose your um, BSS in the tip of that uh, injector, you'll get a little bit of reflux. And that happens if the instrument, if, if the actual handpiece and everything is held down, the water will just fall out of it. So you kind of have to have the technician keep this level or point it up a little bit. Again, that long load or the longer folding in the, in the injector will have um, essentially a stickier haptic. And so I, again, rotate it around and then I just push it towards its sort of origin point and that usually comes off. All right, so we'll go into the chat here. So I don't underfill the eye. Um, I fill the eye completely with OVD, but what happens is you lose 
some of that OVD, it comes out of the eye back into the injector because there's space for it there um, without any OVD in the actual injector. And so you end up losing some of the OVD that you put in the eye as it comes into the injector. You can get this with um, lenses that aren't preloaded. So this is actually um, some reflux that happens pretty intensely with a, a panoptics lens. So that had OVD in the injector, but probably did not have enough fill. Um, for the most part, with those preloaded ones, you get a pretty stable injection as well. That is the end of my presentation. I think so far, I've been pleasantly surprised with the eye hands. I think I have a lot of patients who actually don't feel like they need readers for a lot of activities. So their lifestyle, um, I think is a little bit better. And so it's kind of nice to be able to offer that lens um, without them having to pay more, but it, uh, but it actually gives them a little bit of vision. So, yeah, so I think that that's, that's what I essentially do now is in the chat. You essentially, if you do that full load and, and push the lens all the way to the end of the tip, you won't get as much reflex. And so I think that that's, uh, that's kind of the best way to deal with that. But so far, pretty happy with that lens. Any other questions? It's like we hit the nine o'clock hour. Mm -hmm.